Welcome. Have you considered breaking your legs? Uh, hello, how are you? No, no, seriously, should you? Uh, welcome to this video, by the way, that will surely discuss some stressful topics that I will list um, here. Seriously, look, research shows that as a game class, CEOs are a good 2.5 inches taller than an average man. This, of course, means that asking a surgeon in Turkey to break and stretch your leg bones will make you a new, elongated capitalist overlord. Flourishing under capitalism was never so easy. Concept of looks maxing or enhancing one's specifically male appearance and adjacent characteristics have been rising in popularity lately in the cultural pit of the manosphere, where manosphere is being vaguely defined as an online cultural movement catering all sorts of brilliant ideas to predominantly right-wing men. Some spaces in the manosphere concentrate on advice on how to change and improve one's looks to achieve sexual, financial, social, and other forms of success. From lip scrubs and moisturizers to hormone injections and double jaw surgeries, manfluencers advise men, young and old, on what they should be doing to become no short of the next Elon Musk. Women, money, vacations, and luxury resorts in underdeveloped post-colonial states. Supposedly, every one of men's desires would be at their feet if only they enhanced their looks and performance far enough with the next advertised product or procedure. And look, normally I make videos about women, and even though I make them to attract women to my channel, somehow the gender dynamics of this channel have been quite something. So fine. Fine, I'll bend to the wishes of the algorithm gods for what else a poor sinner can do. And so today, let us turn the tables and finally talk about men. I'll tell you that this video is not yet another video that critiques the toxicity and radicalization of looks maxing and adjacent manosphere movements. Rather, this video is a search to understand why these movements are so toxic and radicalized in the first place. Us ladies have been looks maxing for quite some time now. We put arsenic in fabric and lead into makeup. We engage with many cosmetic and medical procedures, as well as dieting and wellness routines to achieve desired looks for any specific occasion or for our general well being. There are less and more problematic aspects of feminine wellness, but one thing we can say for certain is that it never developed the same outward toxicity and hate that male wellness did under Manosphere. Ideas of beauty, wellness, and health do not have to coexist on the same plane as anti-feminism, aggressive misogyny, ultra-capitalist political ideas, or severe social rejection. Yet somehow, for modern men, especially for younger ones, these ideas often intervene with topics of wellness and men's health. Isn't it strange? Did you ever wonder why? Why, somehow, for young men out there, the idea that they do indeed need to wash their ass and not eat raw garlic before dates exists in the same cultural space that NFTs, discussion of mental disability and belief that women are inferior creatures. Why is Manosphere weird like that? And also, yes, fine, I give up. I'll do this video in parts. Part 1. The man and his crisis. First, I'll take a brief moment to set some definitions for those of us in the audience who are not terminally online. Men-centered advice groups online are called Manosphere. These spaces include several semi-related ideologies and groups, including such as men's rights activists, men going their own way, online influencer fandoms of people like Andrew Tate and Sneeko, or traditionalist fandoms of people like Jordan Peterson. Also conservative groups that rely on visual expressions of masculinity known as Red Pill and their more deterministic Doomer movements buddies known as Black Pill. There are other ones, but for this video I'll concentrate on two subgroups of the Manosphere, Red Pill and Black Pill. Those are the two groups that concentrate their discussion and online content around men's looks, health, and wellness. Ultimately, the difference between the two is that Red Pill believes in salvation through self-improvement, while Black Pill denies salvation in general. Basically, they are Calvinists and Jehovah Witnesses of the Manosphere. Now, with the vocabulary tangents out of the way, we are ready to get to actual meat and potatoes of this video. The man. 
To set the stage, we need to look at a thing we call masculinity of a modern man. Preachers of the manosphere will of course tell you that currently masculinity is in crisis and in decline. Though if we ever look into the history of how conservative figures are viewing masculinity, for them, masculinity was never not in crisis. To traditionalists like Peterson, the crisis of masculinity is not a bug. It is a feature of being a man, a durable business platform for selling men's enhancement medications and self-help books. On the other end, the more liberal and mainstream understanding of masculinity concentrates on discussion of toxic masculinity, which has to do with destructive and self-destructive behavior of men. Due to a choice of vocabulary and conservative fragility, toxic masculinity is often perceived by men themselves as a claim that they themselves are toxic. In retaliation to a rising hard-right narrative, liberal-leaning institutions and even some leftists start contemplating why the hell the men can't just be normal for a minute. I mean, women learned how to cope with neoliberal hegemony quite well, scaling the heights of educational institutions and corporate offices alike. So why can't the men just figure it out? Is it because their mother didn't let them cry? Can't they just go to therapy or something instead of being so damn maladapted? The ideological war over masculinity is ongoing. One direction specifically interesting to me for this video is looks maxing wellness and healthcare. See, healthcare has been having a problem with men and their antiques for quite some time now. For starters, men's life expectancy is kinda shit. On top of that, dragging an average straight guy to a doctor has always been harder than pushing a loaded truck uphill. Male wellness and hygiene have not been any better. The young men desire to be stinky, mean, and annoying because that's apparently manly rarely can be overridden by mother's rumblings about daily showers. Men's Health was published in 1986. And yet, after almost 40 years, men's health remains to be an annoying third testicle. But something shifted in the landscape of men's well-being in the last 20 years with the onset of the internet. We now have the whole online phenomenon of men supposedly taking care of their health, looks, and social determinants of health, such as education and financial stability. Is all of that advice valid? Of course not. But advice it is nonetheless. So shouldn't we be happy for men? Finally, they figured out that they can achieve a more fulfilling life if they start to consistently work out, give up alcohol, and actually go see a doctor instead of pretending that manning up is going to fix their pulmonary fibrosis. <coughs> well, along the way to achieving man's well-being, something went terribly wrong. Discussion of men's health and male wellness are currently almost exclusively located in the manosphere. So topics of wellness in male spaces coexist with violent misogyny, aggressively pro-capitalist ideas, and right of conservative political stances on many questions from taxation to women's rights. I only drink sparkling water because sparkling water is for rich people. The bubbles? You scared of bubbles, you little bitch? So male wellness advice that is coming from manosphere communities has a very particular distinctively rancid smell that has been sensed across the whole internet. Here is a looks maxing thread on gut health and effects that poor diet can have on your mental health, hormonal balance, and mood. And here is looks maxing thread on how women on Tinder are degenerate and women's rights were a mistake. Cool choice of a profile picture, by the way. From my own dive into the looks maxing spaces in an attempt to digest this content, I can also note that there are actually two sets of beliefs when it comes to wellness and health. To make this video even less academically credible than it already is, let's call them drug chad and neo chad schools of thought. Drug chads believe that men's health and wellness are a way to return to traditional masculinity, where man is a center of the family and a pillar of social development. They believe in the importance of intimate connection with women through 
family values and that women need to return to their traditional role in the society as well, such as cooking meatloaves while not having opinions. Neo Chads in return believe that men's health and wellness are the route by which modern men can succeed in an increasingly competitive society. Neo Chads often reduce health and wellness to how they can affect men's visual appeal, and they often believe that one's looks need to be enhanced to achieve personal and financial success. Neo Chads do not really bother too much with traditionalist family values and view women and money solely as points in the game. The more, the better. Trad chads and neo chads also can take any shade of pill and can have any additional identity within the manosphere. So while perspectives on how and why one can ascend to ultimate masculinity vary, opposition to all things feminine in the manosphere wellness remains a constant. Just like the idea of masculinity in real life, the concept of manhood in the manosphere works a little like a point system in a game. Man points are given to man for doing things perceived as traditionally masculine and subtracted for doing things claimed as unmanly, creating a concept that healthcare research usually calls masculine capital. So, for example, studies found that men would avoid using sunscreen under various circumstances because applying sunscreen is apparently gay. The real man gets skin cancer. Masculine capital is one of the reasons why historically healthcare has such a hard time with men and why men die so much earlier. Risky behaviors, substance abuse, and physical labor and participation in violence are all viewed as symbols of manliness, while being sick, getting cancer screenings, and eating six servings of fruits and vegetables per day are considered unmanly. Didn't you know that salads are gay? Due to very rigid norms in the formation of hegemonic masculinity and our highly competitive society, accumulating a healthy load of man points has become harder and harder. So today, for many, manhood is a suffocating vacuum where society sees them as men, but they themselves do not experience that on the internal, personal level. Fracture of masculine identity is what defines man's struggle of today in the current world, and this affects man's health among many other things. Communities such as looks maxing provide a pill for a man, a treatment of sorts. They promise that if only one takes the pill, they will be able to restore not only their masculinity, but ultimately become a man by turning themselves into sexy chads. On to the part two. Part two, the man and his looks. Let's take a closer look at the man himself. His height, face, looks and behavior will be all judged by women in general and for the next hour or so by me in particular. Looks maxing communities refer to the term blue pill to indicate an unproductive advice or a set of beliefs that they consider to be simply a coping strategy that claims that looks don't matter. Men who are absorbed into the manosphere cannot process feel-good advice. They simply do not believe that someone can love them and appreciate them as they are. In addition, we all know that looks do indeed matter. Even if we agree that it is incorrect to make opinions about people based solely on their appearance, our lizard brain does that anyway. The looks are one of the reasons why queer and homeless get targeted with hate attacks. We read a lot from the way the person looks. To make matters worse, a lot of the manosphere spaces are filled to the brim with teenagers. There is a period of time when the teen body looks like a weird combination of adult and child body parts piloted by a drunk pigeon brain. That is all part of becoming an adult. Yet the manosphere sets an expectation that every man needs to look like a rich, muscular white guy between 25 and 30. And expecting teenage boys to look like this is simply mean and stupid. This guy is 27. The high proportion of teenage audience also means that typical looks maxing results, dare I call them that, are just picture of men at the start and at the end of puberty. Though, of course, fabricating insecurities in teenagers is a great platform for online sales. 
Today, a 14-year-old becomes aware of a concept of scalp, and tomorrow they will be buying boldness treatment through affiliated links under YouTube videos. Grown men also commonly fall into the pits of looks maxing and manosphere. The triggers for joining the manosphere community include lack of intimacy, trouble forming romantic and social relationship, poverty, disability, or being a man of color, as in the current world, beauty is often linked to whiteness. Mental health challenges can be a leading factor that traps men of any age in the manosphere. Autism and adjacent disabilities are specifically noted among adult incel or involuntary celibate communities. Functional autism can be an invisible disability, which in the world of relationship means that even if the autistic man is visually attractive, he will still have trouble starting or maintaining a relationship due to their failure to adhere to the norms of social behavior. Intimacy is a real issue of all men with disabilities and, well, people with disabilities in general. One of the biases around disability and disease is that we view disabled people as asexual by default and do not view them as potential partners. Of course, this is simply not a true assessment. There is very, very little in this world that would stop people from fucking each other, and the disability is certainly not one of those things. Aside from aspects related to mental health, we need to talk a little bit about the rite of passage or initiation rituals that affect the downfall of adult men in the manosphere. There are events in one's life that are associated with passing from childhood to adulthood, and these events play a role in forming our gender identity. For cisgender men, these events separate boyhood and manhood, and can be symbolic like going on a hunt, or killing an animal, or getting a driving license. Other initiation rituals can also be more practical, information of independent identity, like moving to live separate from your parents or having children of your own. While now men have a lower chance of passing to manhood by being drafted to die in war, other initiation rituals like moving out of parents' house or building a family of your own are financially unattainable to many. And so, while many social rituals of manhood become inaccessible, more men start to use biological acts as initiation ritual. That way, having sex with real-life women becomes not just a part of becoming an adult, but the main event that splits boyhood and manhood. Getting laid may be hard for some, but it is certainly more accessible than buying a three-bedroom house in a city. For the manosphere, women often become objects of the initiation rituals. Sex with women becomes the means of achieving manhood. While sex being an initiation ritual is an idea all these trees, the focus on sexual act itself is crucial for all aspects of manosphere spaces. Men often come to the looks-maxing community specifically to get sex with women, or to get more of it. In other words, once again, women have to pay through our bodies for the failures of the social institutions of power. Wow, who could have foreseen that happening? What a relationship with a woman is not the end in itself, but is the means of achieving a social status as an adult man, why would we expect monosphere communities to see women as anything but tools? And, well, according to some, those tools should be distributed more fairly by giving every desiring man a sick goth girlfriend. Marginal ideas of state-sanctioned relationship or less marginal ideas of forcing women into sex to satisfy men's needs for intimacy imply that women should be stripped of their body autonomy and other human rights. Manosphere views women as tools that satisfy a man's biological urges and grant them social status. So for manosphere, women are goods and services to be acquired and provided rather than people with the minds of their own. So whenever an adult man faces social and intimate rejection and is unable to lose virginity, be it due to their looks, behaviors, or social status or ability, they are welcomed into the manosphere that forms itself primarily as a community for rejected men. Once rejected adult men end up in the manosphere spaces, they end up looking for the solutions to their struggle. One of the paths to the ascent is looks-maxing, and specifically, rat pill communities. Looks-maxing communities list services, goods, and procedures, as well as ways to become more financially successful in an attempt to finally push the man into the supposed proper manhood. Financial status is very important in the manosphere when it comes to any aspects of looks maxing, because today ugliness can be resolved with enough expenses in surgeon's office. Of course, only a small number of men can afford enough dispensable income to spend on plastic surgeries or invasive procedures. 
So many have to reserve to magical thinking instead. While some of the looks maxing in device is practical, like a lot of the skincare stuff, a lot of it is a sham that is only intended to make men believe that their appearance is about to change. Manosphere articles can claim, for example, that mewing or jaw exercises can straighten teeth without orthodontic treatment. Orthodontics can cost in the perimeter of $10,000 and more for specifically difficult cases. Pressing with tongue and fingers onto the roof of your mouth, though, is free. Mewing is scientifically proven to not do anything to teeth, and changes in successful cases can instead be attributed to puberty, but with enough faith, one can at least believe that their teeth are straightening. And you know, as someone who went through over five years of orthodontic treatments, including plate expansion, trust me, I too dreamed of many options that could replace having a whole steel factory in my mouth. But the reality of many cosmetic medical interventions is that they work specifically because they require expertise, are invasive, long, and painful, and so are unachievable through other means, which by extension also means that beauty indeed is very expensive. But gladly for peasants that choose to take the red pill, there are many so-called soft maxes or socially acceptable, less invasive and often cheaper ways that man can use to improve their looks and other conditions. For example, getting a haircut that fits one's face and clothes that fits one's body, or addressing any burning health concerns as well as adopting healthy eating habits, not only will improve one's looks, but can actually improve one's overall life satisfaction and health. And yes, for the record, eating healthy and buying clothes and especially going to the doctor still requires you to spend money. But brushing teeth and going on a daily walk or a run are fairly accessible to able-bodied men, and paying a tailor to alter one's pants is still miles cheaper than paying a doctor to retailer one's face. In addition to the usual biases that can be rationally acknowledged, modern men are also facing a completely different dating market, where the majority of the partners are now meeting online through dating apps, while typical dating through friends and relatives is declining. Basically, now men are selected based solely on five pictures, name, and about 150 characters if they're lucky. All that means that sadly for single men, when it comes to dating, looks matter the most they ever did. And this competition inevitably drives demand for all sorts of self-help. And a lot of that self-help can be found in the manosphere that often provides men permission to do something that otherwise is viewed by the patriarchy as an unmanly behavior, to take care of themselves. Part 3. The man and his health. Let us take a quick break from talking about the curse of the modern dating market and talk about something more relaxing, like death. Men, like all creatures, are mortal. Which isn't a problem unless you are one of those transhumanist dreamers watching my channel. The problem is, men die quite early. Men suffer 5 to 10 lost years on average, and we just accept it like that's a fact that doesn't need to be questioned. Men are at high risk of avoidable death, such as death due to accidents, violent crimes, participation in imperial wars, workplace injuries, poisoning, neglected medical conditions, and, of course, so. There are less healthcare screening programs for men, and even if there are programs in place, men rarely participate in them, because going to the doctor is what bitches do. Centralized promotion campaigns that encourage healthy lifestyle choices and personal hygiene practices often fall flat, because apparently real men should be as stinky as the shoe of a construction worker in the late August. There is so much statistics on this, I can continue going on for days. But well, we all know boys will be boys. That somehow makes dying in a car crash before 30 more socially acceptable, right? Boys will be boys. We often dissect the phrase, boys will be boys, in terms of harm it causes women who have to deal with those boys once they hit 20s. But it appears that intentionally supporting negligence and aggression in boys harms boys too. Who could have foreseen that happening? There is a lot of gender dynamics involved in male healthcare and wellness. Arguably, male wellness and healthcare are gendered far beyond care targeted towards women or non-binaries. 
In healthcare term, that means that men would avoid seeking healthcare, skip appointments, and delay medical procedures as seeking help is seen as intrinsically emasculating behavior. This is especially related to two fields that are very much related to the topic of manosphere, sexual health and mental health. STDs and diseases in genital areas in general are so deadly to men in part because it is impossible to drag men into screening campaigns where a doctor needs to, you know, touch their soft spot. By extension, men will wait till disease symptoms in the area become quite significant before they seek help, which often means that disease has already established itself by the time they go see the doctor. Trans men in particular can be avoiding sexual health care because inevitably they will have to go to a clinic called along the lines of the Women's Institute for Gynecological Excellence, where they will have to explain themselves to a receptionist for at least 15 minutes. Fixation on the male genitals is also reflected in the black pill communities that claim that issues with sexual function and, as usual, size will define men's success with women. Though, of course, teenage boys measuring their carrots as soon as the girls exit the room is the tradition of the ancients, so take that into account when we talk about the black pill community that, on average, is quite young. Mental health, though, is a whole other beast. And, you know, a typical progressive spiel is that the men are so destructive because they'd rather go speeding on a highway drunk than go see a therapist. Which has a dose of truth to it, of course, as aggressive behavior is unfortunately a more acceptable coping mechanism than self-care for most men. It can also be a symptom of abuse or depression. And until the society changes to accept other emotions in men, this will continue. But the claims about therapy remain ignorant to why men are hesitant to seek mental support or why they say that therapy doesn't work for them. Psychology and psychiatry have been and still are used to limit social and political access of people deemed undesirable. This dynamic is especially true to women that would be claimed dysfunctional and crazy whenever they would voice their concerns about their place in a society. Psychiatric hospitals are still often used as prisons for undesirable elements by governments across the world. Psychology and psychiatry are bound with femininity and disability into some sort of shit triangle. So is it really surprising that men do not want to go to therapy when this medical field has been used for centuries to institutionalize women? This is not to say that therapy today doesn't work. It objectively does work for most of the participants. Rather, what I'm trying to say is that when a person refuses to get help from a place that specializes in providing help, it is not just because their mothers didn't let them cry when they were kids. Due to the history of mental health care being a female-centered field used specifically to assign disabled status for women, participation in therapy can be emasculating to male participants. Admitting to have mental health issues can be viewed as a sign of overall weakness, and so is seeking help from the therapist. To make matters worse, the act of talking about a problem in itself is viewed as feminine and was developed by none other than Freud and Adler for primary female clientele, white female clientele. And they understand that a lot of these problems are linked to the role that the patriarchal society assigns to men and men's inability to break out of gender mold that is set for them. But you know what? When it comes to healthcare, sometimes it is needed that we accommodate a person and meet them where they are, and men totally deserve to be accommodated. So we only start to see therapy and related research that targets men in the early 2000s, which is about one generation of men. Since the research started, cumulative analysis often specifies that men in therapy require an approach that takes understanding of masculinities into account. Men don't want to be treated as gender-neutral patients, and respond better when they are treated as men with account for their specific understanding of masculinity, be it traditional or not. By the way, the same is true for the treatment of sexual diseases. Treatments go better when masculinities of the patient is acknowledged and taken into account during treatment and diagnostics. In mental health research, it is noted that men do not use therapy because they assume that it will not satisfy their needs. However, those needs can be reconciled with therapeutic approach that is more transparent, result-oriented, and collaborative, among other suggestions. All this talk about the need for masculinities to be taken into account in male healthcare is highlighting a striking systematic gap between how healthcare and manosphere are treating men. 
and may explain why women get attracted to manosphere spaces that are actually willingly acknowledging their masculinity. What a fucking surprise! When the same masculine frustrations reappear back in the manosphere, the resulting behavior of men create a typical looks-maxing community, a wellness movement that tries to reconcile with the idea of self-care while stripping itself from all things deemed feminine and emasculating. Some of the associated practices that I found quite amusing in this respect are smashing face with a gua sha stone because just doing a face massage is for pussies, engaging in extreme dieting that aligns with masculine identity, such as carnivore diet consisting only of meat because vegetables are for pussies, or taking estrogen suppression hormones and performing regimens that are supposed to repress estrogen because having those pesky femoid hormones in the blood stream is for pussies. In terms of sex hormones that define our gender presentation, it leads to full-on obsession with anything that increases testosterone and decreases estrogen levels in men's blood, leading to teenagers and young men seeking testosterone treatments at the age when they quite literally just need to grow some balls for a little bit longer. The treatments provided by Manosphere also often carry the same characteristics that drugs and alcohol do in the sphere of adult men's health. Men often reserve to alcohol and other unhealthy coping strategies as those can be viewed as self-administered medication. Same way, men in the manosphere can self-medicate with the choice of procedures and supplements that they see fit without any professional help. Self-administered treatments support person's idea of their independence and prove that the person is mentally and physically able to make their own choices about their health. And independence, as opposed to help-seeking, is a sign of a true alpha male, and so it does not negatively affect masculine capital, even though it can significantly damage men's health. State of being unwell or sick is historically viewed as emasculating to the man, largely because a sick man cannot serve his assigned manly role in the society and disease can significantly drain that masculine capital which I noted earlier. Not this time, Satan, not this time. Sick man cannot use his body as a tool of war, production or oppression, and therefore a sick man is not a man nor a person. Healthcare as a field of work, despite its current historical success, still has a lot of problems. Current medical treatments are made to treat diseases, not people, and aim to restore normal state of body and person where normal is not really defined. What it means to be normal or successful or healthy can take on many definitions, but currently being normal, especially for man, means being able to work. Sense of normalcy in man's well-being cannot be understood without looking at masculinity under capitalism. And I do not have a C-word jar, I'm very sorry, but this is a leftist channel, so if hearing the word capitalism hurts your ears, just keep the volume of this video down to avoid the injuries to your cochlea. Man's ability to dominate, to force himself and others to express a very narrow and standardized type of masculinity lays at the base of what it means to be a normal, healthy man. Association between hegemonic masculinity and normalcy is one of the core drivers, if not the core driver of the manosphere. That's why men's health and men's masculinity is reflected in the looks maxing branch of the manosphere as an idea of a gigachat. Part 4. The Man and His Giga Chat This rather shredded gentleman over here is none other than Russian bodybuilder Ernest Kalimov. Or rather, Giga Chat is a very specific representation of Kalimov done by photographer and artist Krista Sudamalis. Not that you didn't quite guess it yourself, but Pictures like this are the result of artistic craftsmanship of a photographer as much as they are a result of hard work and diuretic use by the model. Strong profile, over-exaggerated facial features, over-exaggerated muscles, perfect hair, and absolute lack of body fat. Gentle smile. Ah. I do think that one of the reasons this particular work of Krista went viral across the internet was because she was able to capture something deeper than simply a perfect male physique. 
she was able to capture a Giga Chad, a real version of a Chad from the internet folklore, an ideal man that the hegemonic world dreams into reality. Giga Chad is an icon of the manosphere, an ideal man that all lesser, regular men are ought to strive to be. It only makes more sense that Giga Chad is more appealing to male gaze than to female gaze. With his looks, he is not only dominating women, he is actually predominantly dominating men. So in a rush to look like Giga Chad and to develop the same vibe, men of all ages and from all walks of life are directed to reconstruct their own masculinity to match that of a Giga Chad, of unrealistic, ephemeral portrayal of a hegemonic masculinity or, alternatively, to accept their inferiority in the packing order. Manosphere animates this desire to remake one's body in the image of the god. A man needs to work out, diet, shoot some juice, and chew that gum to make the jaws big like a brick. I mean, chewing will give you face muscles for sure, just don't get surprised that three years later your dentist is going to start advertising you crowns due to molar wear. Don't say I didn't warn you. Any part of a man from his d to the sclera of his eyeballs needs to be optimized and perfected, every hair perfectly groomed, his skin smooth as marble, as the artist intended to produce what we can perceive as the perfect man. Just like women who aim for a fixed feminine ideal, men are also encouraged to engage in extensive body documentation such as plastic surgeries or tailored medication treatments. Men are encouraged to purchase a series of devices and procedures that would enhance their body to match the ideal, because the ideal in this case is simply not achievable through natural means. Augmentation is required. You need to be willing to undergo severe body augmentation to get to here. And you need to have money to do it. And you need money to inevitably restitch your body to a new masculine ideal whenever GigaChat build stops being meta. And, you know, I am not personally opposed to the idea of plastic surgery in itself. Cosmetic surgery, especially on the face, can be life-changing and can significantly improve lives. Even the noted jaw surgeries, pretty invasive procedures where the whole tooth arc is moved with the bone, that are so popular as a hard maxing practice in the manosphere, those can have unbelievable results for the person's looks, confidence, and comfort. The problem that I have with the surgeries in the manosphere and with surgeries in the beauty industry in general is that medical procedures basically become augmentations that are required for one to achieve high levels of success or to show their social status. Manosphere looks maxing communities are actually actively engaging with philosophy and ethics of transhumanism whether they realize it or not. I am not really using a term transhumanist here because I'm funny and cool like that. The window of economic and cultural opportunities that allows men to realize themselves becomes more and more narrow. Therefore, more aggressive means of body enhancement as well as more aggressive capitalist behavior will be required of men if they decide to continue to take part in the competition for money, women, and ever-shifting success. And if the man's ideal is already unachievable without medical interventions, now it means that more and more invasive enhancements will be required as the race continues. As one of the mechanisms to optimize body enhancements practices and body performance, looks maxing communities are reserved to sciences. As you may have noticed from this video that is heavily seeded with facts from scientific articles, there is very heavy reliance on research and scientific evidence in looks maxing communities. Men's faces are evaluated using ratios and calculations. Black Bill uses social studies to prove to their depressed peers that their lives are over, while Red Pill uses studies to outline the optimized ratio of squats to deadlifts to build the best butt cheeks in town. Men do share their personal opinions of what worked for them on the internet as well, but in general, in Manosphere, you either have to put the numbers on the table or get the fuck out. Some of this obsession with science has to do, once again, with the norms of masculine behavior and desire to exterminate any presence of feminine energy in masculine spaces. Reliance on science, hard numbers, and rational thinking are historically viewed as masculine, as opposed to intuition, rumors, and experience-based arguments that are viewed as more 
feminine ways of reasoning. But the other reason scientism is a popular way of reasoning is a sense of competitive pressure. Modern men cannot spare any false attempts at turning themselves into chads. So something like a research article or scientific evidence gives them more assurance that their actions will actually lead to some positive results. Scientism or overestimation of scientific knowledge comes with a caveat, of course, and often means that results of the articles are misrepresented. Luxmaxers misrepresent the data, typically either by cherry-picking research or by using isolated research articles to draw wide conclusions on the topic. Very often, people in these communities are trying to apply group statistics on the individual level and apply individual case studies and small group statistics to draw generalized conclusions. Black pill orientation is especially prone to such errors in judgment, where sexual and dating preferences of a group of women in the research are claimed to be universally necessary characteristics to achieve success. Black pill communities try to use research to prove that the man is made unlovable simply because of the particular individual visual characteristics, their genetics, or other environmental factors that are conveniently located far outside of the man's control. The overarching problem with all the sciences, in my opinion, is a desire to oversimplify the horror and depths of being perceived by others, especially by potential partners. The sciences is used to dissect and simplify complex and tangled social relationships, to make it less scary, more practical, but also less real. Perception of a potential partner is reduced to a list of visual characteristics and behaviors, like a comprehensive checklist that should be fulfilled for a man to get a girlfriend. What makes Luxmaxing advice practical also makes it very limited and reductionist, because the ultimate horror of the human relationships is that you can do everything right and yet lose, and you can do everything wrong and yet win. If a red-pilled individual completed the checklist but failed to ascend or see failed to become successful, he is then left to combat realization that the checklist was flawed from the start. If those individuals also have issues with self-image, don't have healthy coping mechanisms and support networks, they often reserve to extreme pessimism and admit that all is lost, that they are unlovable, unfixable failures from the very beginning. In the end, the man is left to take the black pill. Part 5. The man and his pills. What is left of a man who is disappointed in his life, appearance, financial position, social status, and convinces himself that nothing can be done to change his life for the better? Oh, who lives in a pineapple under the sea? Black pill guy's self-esteem, apparently. There is pretty much one requirement to join the black pill. One has to give up on oneself to join the party. The reasons to embrace pessimism may be different. Maybe the person suffers from severe issues with self-image, or they face many rejections or even bullying and can't understand how to cope in a healthy way. Maybe they tried to better themselves but did not see an improvement in their social life. Or they find themselves in abusive or unfulfilling relationship but do not know how to exit. This is also a case for men who enter manosphere as teens but remain in the community into adulthood, as opposed to most teens that flee the manosphere as soon as they were able to figure out how to dance the ladies. Another common reason men end up in the black pill spaces is mental or physical conditions that affect their ability to integrate into the society that doesn't accommodate them, such as depression, autism, physical disabilities, or other difficulties. As part of this video, I did a little quantitative analysis on one of the larger Luxmaxing forums, luxmax.org, where black pill and red pill spaces coexist to understand how these communities view their bodies and health. Nothing makes misogyny and depression more digestible than a bunch of Excel spreadsheets, if you ask me. So I present to you this graph, where I map the prevalence of the words used in the title on the scale between oranges at 9 and women at 1560. So closer to oranges we have bipolar, addiction, struggle and stress, and all of those got between 100 and 300 hits. 
Anxiety and depression hit between 600 and 800. Autism scored a little over 1,600. This is more prevalent use of the word on the forum than word women. Prevalence of the word autism is especially important. Autism is a condition known to be overrepresented in the manosphere and especially in its insult populations. I mean, I could maybe crawl through the data and do some qualitative analysis on this post as well, but you know, even though I put a lot of effort into these videos, I draw a line at learning Python. Oh, you wonder what is at the top end of the graph? Well, this is the word side at 2,100 hits. Isolation, economic instability, self-destructive behaviors and other factors that lead people into the manosphere communities, after all, come with a cost. And sometimes the cost is everything. It is not any information though. It has been known for a long time now that suicide is one of the leading reasons for lost life years in men. Risk factors have long been identified as addiction, being single, having depression, being mentally or physically sick, or facing negative or traumatic events in life, which also happen to be risk factors associated with self-identity of incels and, I assume, other manosphere orientations as well. But well, did we ever wonder why is it the case that men experience loneliness and sickness so sharply that the exit door becomes preferable to existence? I am not a doctor. I did go to university specifically to study public health, this is why this video sounds like a pitch for a PhD, but I am not a licensed therapist or a medical professional. But I'll try to give you a shot at analyzing men's struggle based on the things that I've read. Main point I want to discuss is male-on-male -male economic and social competition. Often online, you may see discussion of masculinity as a thing opposed to femininity, notably the ever-present toxic masculinity, one term that by itself is capable of making Twitter conservatives shit hot coals. But I myself, being a prophet of post-feminist gay space anarchist girl club, suggests that the binary feminist perspective on the patriarchy as a system that pitches men over women is slightly outdated. There are different masculinities, combinations of different ways in which men's identity is formed and expressed. Those identities are stacked against each other in a competition for the right way to be a man. See more works from Raven Connell if those are the topics that you want to explore deeper. A lot of this video is just me paraphrasing stuff that she already said 20 years ago, just in a more creative lighting. Manosphere, according to my poor femoid understanding at least, has a very clear vision of a dominant man. He is white, or at least pale, between his 20s and 30s, about 6 feet tall, makes 6 figures, is popular with women, is sexually attractive, has a masculine complexion of a cow on steroids, has flawless skin and hair, he is also straight as a ruler and does not express any symptoms of any neurodivergency or visible health issues. The Apex Man is often visually represented as Giga Chat that we already discussed, or it can be also represented in some male fashion models or sportsmen and TikTok stars. This is the masculinity, the one that is deemed by the manosphere to be superior to all others, while the rest of the ways to be a man are mocked assigned to be subordinate to true alpha way. Men of color do not always share the same masculinity as white men. Poor men's masculinity is placed lower on the hierarchical ladder as those of the rich, and disabled, old, or even temporarily sick men are often tossed off the hierarchical ladder completely. And you know, I want to make this video approachable to the folks who are either in recovery or otherwise are familiar with the manosphere context. So I try to minimize the use of B word in this video, but I have to talk about patriarchy nonetheless. I promise I will do it very quickly, so you won't feel anything, it will just be like a little pinch. Patriarchy is often claimed as a system in which women compete with men who hold most of the power in the society. But patriarchy is just as much a system in which men compete with other men who hold most of the power in the society. So whenever manosphere gurus vomit rancid ideas like men have it far worse than women, they talk about the male experience of competition between man and man, competition between different masculinities. So manosphere prophets fail to identify the fact that aggressive 
man-on-man -on -man competition is a feature of many hierarchical structures such as patriarchy, capitalism, or state, and that this manfluencers desire to strengthen those systems rather than dismantle them. I guess some men would gladly sacrifice their own well-being and well-being of their bros just to stick it to women. I'm sure Freud would have had something to say about this man's matter fixation if this was his video. But alas, Freud is dead and we need to continue. The competitive structure of male-on-male -male hierarchy is partially biological because neither romantic nor social success are a given. But understanding current dynamics of male-on-male -male competition as purely biological is deeply misleading, unless you think that people are just a colony of monkeys with nuclear bombs and space rockets. Multiple existing hierarchical systems of power reinforce and worsen male competition, turning it from sportsmanship into a fight. Men are expected to force themselves and each other into the shape of a young, buff, rich white CEO of a tech startup or accept their inferiority on social ladder. The systems of financial competition also play a significant role. Actually, in my humble view, financial competition currently plays a leading role in shaping male competition. Real financial capital can be easily converted into a masculine capital, as well as loss of financial capital can be damaging masculine capital too. If one has money to afford a personal trainer, personal cook, access to medical and beauty professionals, clothes that fits, and a behavior therapist to up their social game, it means they can also buy a better health, longer life, and if they so desire, community and family. Figures like Andrew Tate feed specifically off this sharp financial competition between men. His main shtick is just telling men to become more rich by any means necessary, be it illegal or unethical, as in his way, money is the key that opens all chests. Though, of course, the only person who gets richer of his advice is Tate himself and other grifters who sell success courses to underage boys. Guys, if this video gets 1000 likes, I will release a special video on how to become rich and famous by next Friday, so please remember where the like button is. So as the window of financial success narrows and financial wealth accumulates in the hands of the few, more and more men are left at the bottom of the capitalist ladder. They are left to be working endlessly, utilizing their bodies as tools of capitalist production with no gain to their own. Somehow, for many, of course, in the manosphere, the lack of financial success of an average working class man is woman's fault, another curious case of mother fixation. But let us not strive too far away from the topic. So, as capitalist competition sharpens and there is less masculine capital to go around, the competition between men becomes sharper as well. A solution that Manosphere then proposes to men is to teach them how to compete and how to become better in playing by the rules of the systems that oppress them. Oh well, let's praise those naive enough to believe that enforcement of the hierarchy somehow would ease their struggle under the same hierarchy. The ideological embrace of manosphere drags into other areas of men's life as well. If one believes that some men are superior to other men, it is only as intuitive to believe that men are superior to women, and that some groups of people are superior to others. Once the man bites on a red pill, he has to swallow the whole medical cabinet of political and cultural notions that are rooted in ideas of superiority and domination as well. And the worst part is that manosphere advice actually kind of works under conditions of capitalist competition, as in war of all against all, the winner is never the nicest guy in the room. Enter the rat race and run 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 and you will indeed move up the packing order. Well, at least there is a chance that you will. In their discussion of black pill and red pill, Lux Maxing forums often refer to a five-foot balding Indian janitor fallacy an unfortunate looks maxing folklore character that has an interesting racial dimension. As in, imagine a five-foot aging janitor who is financially unsuccessful, conventionally unattractive, and racially marginalized. Imagine how terrible his life supposedly is. The red pill competition techniques are inapplicable to this man. Aging janitor in question is not going to win the top spot in the hierarchy no matter how much he tries. Balding janitor then, according to the black pill community, is a proof of their superiority over the red pill. Black pill claims that those who are not already born with beauty and wealth will not be able to achieve those by their own means, that they will forever remain unlovable losers. 
And while the black pill critique of red pill can be valid in some cases, black pill still misses the point that both red pill and black pill are located within the same frame of harsh hierarchical male competition on the belief that they have to take part in a race and that they have to compete and to suffer and to dispose of their bodies as weapons in this competition. In reality though, both pills are wrong. Man-on-man -man competition doesn't need to be a central pillar of man's identity and his success. So one must imagine a five-foot balding Indian janitor happy. Part 6. The Man and the White Pill the main issue of manosphere spaces is that their so-called solutions for men are also reinforcing the same actions and beliefs that leave men struggling in the first place. It is a self-reinforcing cycle of despair, where men are forced to fight with each other over and over or stew in bitterness that they were left on the bench during the Hunger Games. This of course all means that manfluencers would be getting richer as far as manosphere exists, but also it means that in this game, no one except for them truly wins. The only solution then is to exit the race, to exit Manosphere, or in Manosphere terms, to take a white pill, to find inner balance and to embrace hope and to believe that a man can have a happy and fulfilling life even though the world around him is challenging. Of course, even though all of this sounds nice, white pill is not easy to swallow. For one, it includes admitting to oneself the wrongness of their ideas, which is hard. Plus, there is not much real-life support for this man. That means that the men who are dragged into the manosphere due to their loneliness often also have to crawl out of there while being lonely. So one of the immediate solutions that would be beneficial to manosphere recovery, in my opinion, are peer support groups, preferably support groups in real life, but online communities are also an option. People that have the same understanding of the problem and create space without stigma to share ideas in the group can reinforce recovery and address setbacks, as well as give otherwise lonely people an alternative community to hang out with. But support and recovery are only of use to those who admit it to themselves that manosphere forms are not a productive use of their brain power. Support groups have no effect on preventing men from falling into the manosphere grifts in the first place. What we need is a new framework on how we view and understand man, one that forms a masculine identity, but that promotes fulfillment of man in a healthy way and in sustainable manner, while also leaving behind all dogmas of self-destructive behaviors. And this is the thing that I'd like to address here, is that women and people who do not identify as men won't really be much of help here. Manosphere influencers often say that Manosphere is so popular because feminism failed men. But the thing is, feminism could never save men in the first place, because that is just not something that feminism can do by its nature. Feminism liberates all, but it doesn't create alternative identities. They hope that feminism, or widely, women, ought to change their behavior and reshape society to save men is fake. Adult men asking adult women to save them from themselves is nothing more than a child's cry for mother to save them from the cold of the outside world. But the thing is, there is no mother coming to save masculinity. It is just not a thing. It is in the hands of men to form their own identities. I can make an hour-long video dissecting the manosphere, and I can give men a hope, some solutions, and a promise, but I cannot produce an alternative way of being a man, which in the end would be a solution to man's struggle. And well, now actually, there are people that do both produce ideas and content that actively works on producing a healthier frame for a straight man. Though I have noticed two issues while researching for this video. First issue is that in the leftist spaces that are expected to produce the alternative for the right-wing manosphere, topics of masculinity are still stigmatized. We often critique manosphere and negative traits and behaviors that can be associated with masculine identity, but rarely produce an alternative framework of ideas. Instead, often the advice is given to men to simply drop perceived negative masculinity traits such as aggression, domination, or competitiveness, and other instead of challenging men to find more productive and beneficial uses for those traits. This advice produces the same problem that neutralizing masculine identity does to men in terms of healthcare and wellness. 
removal of man's identity and chopping off the slices of masculinity deemed undesirable simply produces a lack of identity, a split between man's self and their body. It doesn't change the man, but erases him. Second issue is somewhat outside of our hands. The media and informational sources that are building healthy masculinities are not very popular with algorithms on the internet as this media is not reactionary in its nature. Selling fake courses and advertising fake products, as well as saying that all problems in your life are caused by things that men do not control, like women, or testosterone exposure in fetal stages of development, that is to say, women's bodies. All that stuff sells well. Well, building an alternative is hard and isn't popular with algorithms. In addition, being a better man actually requires effort. Learning a new skill, or giving up bad habit, or picking a new healthy habit, trying to take care of people in your life, or working on your courage or strengths of character, and for example, cultivating positive traits, all that requires actual work. While sitting on the ass in front of the computer, getting angry at women that one never talked to only to be followed by watching porn, that requires close to zero effort. But this is not to say that we should stop encouraging the development of healthy role models for men or just fall into despair simply because TikTok doesn't like what we make. Any road for the better is worth taking, be it hard or be it less algorithmically optimized. If we want to do better for the man of today and for the man of tomorrow, we ought to act to create the world that provides men with opportunities for growth, that accepts many and all masculinities. And we ought to build a world that provides men with healthier ideas of what they can be and opportunities to make that happen. And that was it for today. I'd like to extend my special thanks to Athena and Nicola Soviedo. All my videos are produced with the help of my patrons who give me money that I can use to buy all the fancy light bulbs. And if you liked this video, consider watching my other video about the Christian nationalism and Jesus in online spaces. I worked really hard on that video, but it never really caught up with the algorithm, so consider giving it a shot. Other than that, thank you for watching and subscribe so we see each other on the next one.